Let's begin with a prayer. Our Father, we come together this morning at this time to worship you. As we've sang these songs and meditated upon the feast, celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and as we've prayed prayers, we prayed that they've all been in accordance with your will, Father, that you've been glorified through the, our efforts. And now be with us as we look into your word. Help us to understand what you would have us to do and what you would have us to be. And may we, through our efforts, bring glory to your most holy name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What's the meaning of life? You know, a lot of volumes have been written on that very question. What does life really mean? It becomes a philosophical question, but in reality, it is a spiritual question. What we're going to do this morning in the time that we have is to discuss the meaning of life. Now, either we will determine that life has no meaning, and we will consider ourselves no different than basically a well-dressed ape void of anything good and everlasting. That's one thought. The other is we'll choose to walk with God, finding life's fulfillment through pleasing God and by serving Him and looking for a home in eternity. These are our choices. So, I wonder this morning what choices we have made. Now, sometimes we get a little bit in the gray area, and some people will think, well, yeah, there is a God, but then they act like the first one, like there is no eternal life. And they live their daily existence just like there was no God, even though they make a profession that they believe in God. Some look for meaning in alcohol, drugs. Some look for meaning in the arms of other people, males, females. Some search for meaning through a healthy body. Some search for meaning through friends. Some search for meaning through their jobs. Some search for meaning through the uh, uh, relationships with their family, some through their phil uh, for their good deeds. All of these things that are supposed to bring meaning to one's life has no effect whatsoever. And life still ends up meaningless. You know, it's been said that Without God, there is an existential wasteland. And that's exactly what it is. Without God, man lives in an existential wasteland. Richard Dawkins said, The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no purpose, nothing but pitiless indifference. Now, that's his conclusion. And by the way, that is the right conclusion if there is no God, which is his platform. Graham Lawton wrote an article in The New Scientist where he said, what is the meaning of life? The harsh answer is, it has none. Your life may feel like a big deal to you, but it is actually a random blip of matter and energy in an uncaring and impersonal universe. How would you like to be an atheist? How would you like to wake up every morning with that kind of philosophy in your life? An impersonal, uncaring Meaningless universe. 
Existential thinking, which is the product of atheism, leaves its constituents in this wasteland. In New York, not too long ago, a man was found after committing suicide. There was a crumpled note in his hand. The note read, I am a nothing. I am an absolute nobody. I have decided to stop myself and get out of the way. I am nothing more than a peanut at Yankee Stadium. Wow. You see, if there's no God, that despair can be quite common. And in fact, I think it's interesting that with the, with the uh, uh, atheism and existentialism growing as it has, so has suicide. I mean, if your life is nothing, if it is as this man felt, like a peanut in, in uh, Jones Stadium, then what good are you? Life becomes meaningless and without any kind of hope. A man in another city stood teetering on the edge of a building, debating on whether to jump or not, when down below someone said or shouted, Go ahead, jump. You ain't nothing anyway. He jumped. And he died. What a life. Where's your hope? Where, what, what meaning is there in your existence? If you're like Dawkins said or Lawton said, if, if there is no meaning to it, I want to talk just a minute about a man by the name of Solomon. Oh, Madeline Murray O'Hare. Don't let me leave her out of the picture. There is no meaning to life other than what you give it. And, and by the way, she's really right. If there's no meaning to life, then you give it the meaning. That's existentialism in a nutshell. We make our own rules. We play by our own rules. We come up with what we want to do. We call what we want good, what we want bad. And that's our choice. And if you don't think that's it, read the Humanist Manifesto. That's exactly what the Manifesto holds. Okay, and by the way, I think by now, Mer Med uh, Madeline Madeline, as uh, I like to refer her, has just realized that there it was meaning in life. She's passed violently. Solomon actually did that which a lot of people want to do. He had all this wealth, all this power, all this prestige. He received all these accolades. The Queen of Sheba came and said there's no king like him in the world that has the kind of power, prestige, and wealth that Solomon had. So he had the ability to run a test. And basically it was an existential test. He researched knowledge. He could do that because he was one of the wisest men that has ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. When asked what he wanted, he prayed for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. In chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, he came to the same conclusion about knowledge and wisdom that he did everything else. All is a vanity and a vexation of the Spirit. Riches. All the money that, uh, uh, is, that could be desired. Uh, uh, he had his uh, barns was full of animals. He had chariots. He had a great army. He was a king of a nation greatly feared. All vanity, he said, and a vexation of the spirit. Honor to be the king of this great nation. Vanity, 
vexation of the Spirit. It's a striving under the sun. Pleasure. He could have anything or any woman he wanted. And he did. But he found the same answer. All is a striving under the sun, a vexation of the Spirit. Building projects. He carried on a lot of building projects while a king had great possessions. And yet all was a vanity and a vexation of the Spirit. A striving under the sun. He uses the word or the phrase under the sun quite a few times in the uh, book of Ecclesiastes. And by the way, I think it's interesting. The word Ecclesiastes means the preacher. So here the preacher is actually experimenting with all of these things and the end of it is it's all vanity. Vexation of the Spirit. Everything on this earth, everything under the sun, in other words, the sun represented the first heaven. Without, you know, under the sun represented those things under first heaven on this earth. Everything that is physical, material, to that all these things under the sun is worthless. It's like a handful of cobweb. There, there's nothing to it. Of course, we have his conclusion about all these things in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was a vanity and a grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Folks are killing themselves for that which has no profit whatsoever in their lives. Folks are dedicating their whole life to things that doesn't matter. Folks have put God on the back burner for these things, for these things, for these possessions, for our, our labor, and put them all before God, and it doesn't matter. All that, like Solomon said, is just vanity, is a vexation of the Spirit. Why would we do that? Can you imagine a life if it, there was no God? If there is no God, there is no meaning. If there's no God, there's definitely no meaning. This life does have no meaning. Therefore, here's the conclusion of the whole thing, Solomon said. Let us hear this conclusion of the whole matter. After all of this experimentation, after everything money can buy, after all the pleasures I desire, after all the buildings I've built, all the accolades I've received, here's the bottom line. Here's the conclusion. Fear God and keep His commandments. He got that part right. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. That means it's his purpose. It's his morning, it's his, his reason for getting up in the morning, and it's the last thing on his mind when he goes to sleep at night. It is his everything. That's the conclusion of the matter. If you want substance in your life, then fear God. Keep his commandments. Make him your all in this life. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work 
and to judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. God knows everything. He is omnipotent, omniscient, he's all seeing. And then result, when we stand before him, he will know. And he will judge us according to our works. There will be no excuses on the day of judgment. Because God knows. There is a God and He is alive. That's one of my favorite songs. No God that's in O and die eternally. No God that's K-N-O-W and live eternally. We can know that the God of the Bible exists. I'm not going to go into these arguments. We've done it several times and so I think you're aware of them. Matter demands a maker. Nothing happened at random. Design demands a designer. Same point. There has to be a design for there to be a designer or a designer to be a design. In life, there has to be a life giver. Where does life come from? An amoeba in some scum pond? I think not. The Bible demands an author. As we've talked about so many times, over a thousand years, 40 different authors, not one contradiction. All of it unfolds into a beautiful, organized structure of God's plan for salvation. Erupting in triumph over the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the church beginning in Acts 2. And men and women finding salvation through that plan that God organized. All of these four arguments show that there is a God. You know, I've talked about this fellow before. And he really is to me kind of an, a success story in a way. His name is Anthony Flew. And I'll, I'll get to the scripture in a second. Anthony Flew in 1979, maybe 80, 81, was in Denton, Texas, representing atheism. You see, the atheists went out and got their champion to go against a man by the name of Thomas Warren. How many, I've, I've asked this before, but how many of you have heard Thomas Warren speak? Amazing mind. One of the greatest minds of all time. He stood on that platform and Anthony Flew signed a proposition that stated, I know, K-N-O-W, I know there is no N-O God. I know there is no God. And for five nights, he debated that proposition. And of course, the other proposition stand, uh, written by Thomas Warren was, I know, K-N-O-W, there is a God. By the way, World Video Bible School has that debate. If you want to, it is amazing. You might want to look it up sometime and, and listen to it and watch it. Years later, I'm talking about quite a few years later, 40, 30, about 30 years later, studying the biology of mankind, looking at DNA and other aspects of life, Mr. Flew became an avid believer. In fact, 
he wrote in 2007, shortly before his death, I must say again that the journey to my discovery of the divine has thus far been a pilgrimage of reason. I want you to think about that for a minute. What is he saying? He's saying it is unreasonable to believe there is no God. Reason will tell you itself there is a God. And that debate, he realizes that he was unreasonable. Let's go on. I have followed the argument where it has led me. He said, I, I've studied it out. I've looked at it. I've examined it. I've experimented. And it has led me to accept the existence of a self-existent, immutable, immaterial, omnipotent, and omniscient being. In an article that is entitled, There is a God, 2007. Wow. You know, I want to see something. I want to go back just a second. I want you to think about what led him to that conclusion. These points that we talk about so often, they're rather simple points. They're just reasonable points. He worked his way through all of this to the point from saying, I know there's no God, to saying, there is a God. You see, that's what truth does. Hope I didn't. There it goes. The Bible makes man complete and gives him purpose. You want purpose? Study the scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Since God is our creator, then we need to read his book. And it's profitable. It is worthwhile. It has meaning for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete. The word perfect is used in some translation. That means complete. That means that he can have a well-rounded knowledge, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible is the key to finding meaning in your life. Life does say or does have a spiritual meaning. As I mentioned in the very beginning, the question asked, does life have meaning? And remember I said it is a spiritual question, not a philosophical question. Philosophically, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what men say, what men think. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what God has revealed. You see, the meaning in life comes from God. Life is but a vapor that appears for a short period of time and then it vanishes away. If you watch steam coming off of a body of water early in the morning, it's not long until that steam is gone. That's your life. How horrible it would be to live that short life and don't have any meaning to it. Knowing that God has created us in His image gives us the understanding that we do have purpose. You remember that little cartoon of the little boy standing in the corner? How many of you, when you were growing up, got well acquainted with a corner in your schoolroom? We had little circles on the chalkboard that we had to stick our nose. That's where our they had one just with my nose print on it. (laughs) 
in that little cartoon, the little boy says, God ain't through with me. He never made junk. He ain't through with me. He never made junk. God doesn't make junk. He made us in His image. That makes us different. We are not well-dressed apes. We are human beings in the image of God. Now that's where our purpose comes from, folks. From God. And yet, we treat God as if He has no meaning to our life. We don't dedicate that much of our life, that much of our time, to God. And yet, He is our life. And now Paul said, when Christ who is our life, I mean, it's amazing to me that a man who calls himself a Christian can't hardly even get together on a Sunday morning to come to worship. Or much less Sunday night or Wednesday night. What's up with that? As I mentioned, God doesn't accept excuses in the judgment. We find our purpose in the good works we do for God. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works, but glorify your Father in heaven. Do you know why I believe with all my heart today, and I'm convinced of the reason why atheism has taken the hold that it has is because we as Christians have shown our religion to be puny, weak, Uninteresting. We can pick and choose what we want to do in religion. While something that's unimportant, it stands to reason that maybe there's not a omnipotent, omniscient built, uh, being that has the ability through His Word to control His people. So there must not be a God if it's so unimportant to His people. <laughs> Ephesians 2 and verse 4. We read there in this great chapter of His love toward us, sin and His Son. But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love wherewith He loved us. For God so loved the world, He didn't do a thing, did He? Not one thing God has done because He loved the world. No, excuse me, that's atheism. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. What are we giving in return? You see, there's our meaning in life. That's what our life is all about. We talked about this in Bible class. We give God a piece of our life. He doesn't want a piece of our life. He wants me. And it's in my relationship with Him where I find my meaning. We can lose our jobs. We can lose the people we love. We can lose the desires and the passions and the, and the things that we have in this life. We can, we can lose our possessions. We can lose all of that. What's left? If there's no God in our life, what's left? Go back to the stock market in the 30s. What happened? When men lost their, their wealth, that was everything to them. A lot of them committed suicide, didn't they? Even as close as, what was it, 1998, I believe it was, or pretty not too long ago, uh, the stock market, stock market kind of crashed. And people hit the panic mode. Well, if that's all your life consists of, yeah, you're going to panic. 
but not the Christian. There's no better life than the life that we have in God. We have the hope of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. If in the manner of man I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He said, you know, I, I've... And he's talking about the beast of uh, false teaching. He said, I've fought with these guys. I've dedicated my life to it. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I, I was left for dead. What's it all worth if there's no God? And if we're not going to be raised? I've wasted my time, my energy, my efforts. Therefore, it would be, it'd be okay to live existentially, which is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. In other words, get everything you can in this life because there's nothing left. Do everything you want to do in this life because there's no life hereafter. I can't stand that thought. If there's no life hereafter, then that means there is no God. And if there is no God, I'm living a life wasted. But I know, I know, I am convinced that there is a God. And it's not just a leap in the dark. It's faith in facts. So since there's a God, I must dedicate my life to Him. Live for Him. My efforts should reflect His glory. And then the Spirit returns to God. Once I'm through with this old body, it's going to decay. But you see, being the image of God, we have a Spirit. And that Spirit, Ecclesiastes 12 or 7, will return to God. Body, back to dust. But the Spirit, that which I really am, the person I am, the, the person I, I, sh I have been, it will go to God. But what if I haven't lived my life for God? Our reward is heaven. Wow. I mentioned a while ago, and I want to say it again. Imagine the greatest day on this earth. The most profound, the, the most beautiful day you've ever had. It pales against heaven. Think about the worst day you could imagine on this earth. And it pales against hell. But for the Christian who has faithfully lived and dedicated his life to God, been a servant in his kingdom, doing good works, we have a reward, and the reward is heaven. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 12. Romans 8, verse 18, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What we are going through on this earth is nothing. He said, I'm going to heaven. Bring it on. Life, bring it on. I'm going to heaven. There's my reward. You can't touch me. There's nothing you can do to steal my reward. It's better to die, Paul said, and to be with the Lord. Or it might be more helpful for you if I remain behind. But for me, it'd be better if I could be with the Lord. But as long as he's on this earth, he was dedicated to living for the Lord because he wanted to go see the Lord. So, if we want to go to heaven, 
We've got to live our life on this earth like we want to go to heaven. In dedication of body, mind, and spirit. How do you want to be remembered? Labor. Solomon said all vain. It's a vexation, a, gra a grasping after the wind. Pleasure, same. How do you want to be remembered? Well, he's a good old boy. There was a story told about a preacher that had to do a, a funeral. You know, funerals are, are hard to do, especially a funeral of a non-believer, of a non-Christian. Just ask Rick. We've probably done many of them. What do you say about someone who wasn't prepared to die? Well, this preacher was faced with that dilemma. In fact, this is a pretty rotten scoundrel. And in order to say something good about the man, he said, boy, he sure could whistle. The only thing he could imagine good about the man is he could whistle. How do you want to be remembered? A man who prepared, or a woman who has prepared their life for heaven. Or just a person. You know, think about, in closing... How the apostles are all remembered. How the disciples, all those who come in contact with Jesus and who is affected by his life, how they are remembered and how they are listed in God's Word. The legacy they left behind for us. I pray that when I shuffle off this mortal coil, and go to my reward that at least my family, my friends, the people that I have associated with can say, Jackson was a Christian. He lived for God. If not, then my life has been wasted. If I'm not living that way, this morning, every one of us have a decision to make. Every one of us. Like I said in the very beginning, either we can choose to live our life without God, without meaning, without purpose, die without meaning, without purpose, and you know what's left. Or we can choose to live life to its fullest Serving God. And by the way, there is no gray area. It is an either or. Being His servant and being a servant to Him to the point of death. Realizing that everything under the sun is just vanity and a vexation of the Spirit. There is meaning in life. And God gives it to us. I need to come and encourage you to do so. Always stand singing.